All right, let's get started. Today I want to talk about Blockstack. Um, and the reason we're looking at this paper is that it touches on three questions that um, I find quite interesting. One is maybe at the lowest level, how to build a naming system or really a, a public key infrastructure that maps from names to public keys. Uh, and this is like a very important question. Nobody has ever really figured out a convincing way to build a general purpose uh, global public key infrastructure, PKI. So any progress in this area would be, uh, um, is interesting. Another reason I'm interested in, in Blockstack is that it's a non-cryptocurrency use of a blockchain. Um, and, you know, so it's just an interesting question whether blockchains are uh, useful for anything other than, than financial stuff. Um, and finally, and you know, maybe most interestingly, Blockstack's really a, um, a proposal for a very different architecture for how um, internet services or really websites, how websites ought to be constructed, very different from the way they're constructed now with quite different properties. Um, and you know, the idea is that maybe the, the kind of approach Blockstack takes might yield um, websites that are, are better you know, in some ways than current websites. Um, now, Blockstack's a real system. There's a company um, that's developing it. Uh, it's in use by some applications. Um, does have some users. H however, it's really, you know, you should view it as more a work in progress than a kind of, this is the final answer. They've been developing it and making it better um, over some years now. Uh, I don't think it's really to the point where very many people would decide to abandon the way they build websites now and switch to Blockstack. But um, it's very important that somebody out there is um, exploring how things could be different and better. Um, and you know, Blockstack is one of a number of different projects that are uh, trying to push in a different direction for the overall architecture of websites. All right, so the, um, the pitch from Blockstack is that people ought to be building decentralized applications. Um, so what does decentralized mean? Um, this is sort of an idea that's been in the air for a couple of years now. Um, I, I think the, maybe the best summary is that it's applications that are built in a way that moves ownership of data out of centrally controlled websites, you know, like ordinary web servers, and um, one way or another puts control of users' information um, more into the user's own hands so that it's, uh, sort of uh, realistic to say that users actually own their own data instead of, you know, Facebook or um, Gmail or whoever sort of essentially owning their data for them. Um, the uh, success and the interesting properties of Bitcoin have been a lot of what's driven the recent activity in this area. It's, it's kind of an old idea. It dates back at least to peer-to-peer -peer, um, schemes like Nutella and Napster from around 20 years ago and uh, farther back than that, but um, Bitcoin really uh, prompted people to think hard about this and to sort of um, have a bit more faith that these kinds of uh, ideas could be realized. All right, so um, I wanna kind of outline uh, uh, first what a sort of centralized, typical you know, current website looks like, um, talk a bit about why uh, some people aren't really pleased with the way uh, current websites work um, and then outline how uh, things might work under a decentralized scheme like Blockstack. So this is really current um, websites. Uh, the deal is you got a bunch of users sitting in front of browsers um, and there's a internet, they all talk to the internet. Um, you have some website out there, you know, maybe it's say Gmail or something. And uh, Gmail has a bunch of web servers um, that are owned by Gmail, right? Owned by whatever the web service is. And um, sitting behind the web servers is some kind of database. Right? It's kind of a familiar picture for us. Um, so you have these individual users, this database uh, holds the user's data. Like if you use Gmail, you know, your, um, you know, user one's Gmail is sitting in Gmail's database somewhere. Um, you know, this is a database server that Gmail owns and has control over uh, the kind of logic for um, how Gmail operates um, 
essentially uh, sits in the web servers that uh, owned by, or are owned by Gmail and sort of talk to the database to get out of your data. All right, so there's like totally nothing surprising here. Um, and you know, this is the way almost every website works. There's often some JavaScript or something in sitting in the user's browsers, but all the kind of critical stuff um, is sitting in web servers that the, or some kind of servers that the uh, website owns. And, you know, so for different websites, the data in the database is going to be things like blog posts or mail or, you know, comments you post on other people's, you know, on Reddit or something, or maybe it's your photos, your calendar, or maybe it's your medical records or something. There's a lot of data that's out there at various different websites um, that is in some sense, you know, the user's data, like it's really the user's Gmail, but gosh, um, it's Gmail or it has control over it or um, Reddit that has control over the user's comments on other people's articles. Now, this setup's been super duper successful, right? It's actually, um, one of the reasons is that it's extremely easy to program. Um, you know, all the logic here is in running in servers controlled by Gmail, they can, talk to these databases, which are often things like SQL databases that have very flexible query interfaces. There's like no restrictions on what data can be accessed. Like, um, you know, so supposing this is eBay that's running here, um, you know, the user's bids are sitting in eBay's uh, database server. Now the bids are quite private, right? And if I'm bidding on something, I don't want other users to see it, but there's no restrictions on what eBay's web servers can look at. They can all look at the bids in the, uh, in their own database, they can look at other people's bids, find the highest bid, there's really no restrictions. So it's very, very convenient um, for web developers. And it's very successful. And so from that point of view, we should be you know, skeptical that anything else could possibly be this successful or overtake it. But the reason why you might not think this current setup is perfect, um, well, there's a bunch of reasons that users might be dissatisfied. Um, one is that if I store my mail in Gmail, I really have to use Gmail's interface to get at it. And, you know, maybe they provide some other ways of getting at it, but I generally don't have a lot of freedom. Like Gmail sets the rules for how I get at my own email, right? So I might be a little bit irritated. It's my email, but, you know, I, I don't get to choose what interface I use. I can't just use any software. It really, uh, pretty much has to be software that Gmail provides or Gmail supports. Um, for uh, situations like maybe Facebook, um, where other people might sometimes see my data. It's really the website that gets to set the rules uh, for who gets access to my data or how, if at all, I can control that access. And websites often um, are a bit murky about their promises about how they enforce this stuff. Um, and again, if it's the user's data, like if it's my photos or my posts or something, it's really kind of not that great that um, I don't have too much control over what the website can do with it. Um, another thing that people complain about with the current setup is that the website can snoop on my stuff. Like Gmail wants to look through my mail. They, they might have good reasons for it. Maybe they're training their spam generators, so that's okay. But, you know, maybe they're looking at my email to think about showing me advertisements or to, uh, you know, tell their advertising customers what people are interested in these days. Um, worse, the, um, there's a chance that some of uh, the employees who work at the website are corrupt and maybe snooping on people's data for personal reasons. Um, so that maybe the company, maybe the company that runs the website is perfectly above board, but can't necessarily say, claim that it's not always true that all of the employees are, um, are following all the rules. Um, anyway, so people have a lot of kind of, you know, or some people have reservations about the way the current system works. Um, at a kind of more design technical level, um, one way to view what's going on here is that the main interface here um, is between the entire website and uh, the browsers. So there's it's HTML that's flowing back and forth between here typically. Um, the uh, websites and the database are sort of integrated on this side of the interface and all the browser really gets to see often is this HTML kind of final packaged form of the data. Um, and uh, you know, it's a very user interface oriented representation HTML is um, and sort of not, has nothing to say about, you know, data, the data itself or how the data is controlled. 
Um, and the much more interesting interface and where this you know, whole discussion is kind of going is that um, this is a much more interesting interface because it, it's much closer to the data, um, but in the standard setup, the, there's no real boundary there. The, uh, this is sort of the internal business, how this works is the internal business of the website. All right, so that's the existing plan. Um, the plan, the kind of plan that Blockstack is proposing, um, and so, so there's a number of kind of ideas for how decentralized apps might work. This is kind of one of them. Um, uh, so I'm not going to call it Blockstack yet because it's, um, uh, it's kind of much a very simplified version. Um, but we'll just say it's a decentralized um, architecture. Um, and here the game is that you know we still have a bunch of users and users run you know iPads or browsers or something. Um, but um, we're gonna, in this new decentralized scheme, we're gonna put all of the app code is gonna run um, in the client machines, in the user's machines. And so this is much more like a sort of traditional, it's like you know, downloading an app from the app store on an iPad or um, buying um, sort of old style PC hardware, like buying a copy of Microsoft Word that just runs on your laptop. Just you buy some software, you run it on your laptop. Um, so no, no longer running the application code in web servers. Well, you know, um, if all you want to do is use data on your own laptop, your own data on your own laptop, then then we're done. Um, but what's really interesting about you know web-based or about internet-based applications is that um, you can store your data in the cloud, and that means you can, if you have multiple devices, which most people do, um, you can get at your data from any of your devices, from your maybe your iPhone as well as your laptop. And if you store data in the cloud somehow, um, that means you can share data with other people and build multi-user applications like, you know, um, eBay maybe or Reddit or who knows what shared calendars. Um, so the other half of the um, decentralized vision is that there's going to be a storage system, um, a, some sort of cloud storage system um, out there, by which we mean, I mean, um, uh, some sort of service that you can buy, maybe, you know, from Amazon, AWS, or who knows where, um, which will just store data for you. You can stick data in it, it's your data, um, they store it for you, back it up, um, do may hopefully some sort of access control so other people can't get at it, and then you can retrieve it later from any of your devices. And so um, now if we're building some sort of, you know, for um, single user applications, like, you know, I just need to edit some documents, but I want to keep them in the cloud, you know, maybe user one is buying storage from this storage server, maybe it's Amazon, and user two is buying storage from, uh, maybe Google's cloud storage system. Um, for my own data, I just talk to my own, my application code talks across the internet to the service, storage service that I buy storage from, presumably pay for it myself. Um, and user two talks similarly to their storage service. But if we run um, applications that are uh, um, built to allow users to share data, then there's the possibility that if I know how to talk to YouTube's storage service, I can run an application that um, reads data that they allow me to read as well. So, you know, if you wanted to build some sort of Facebook-like thing on this, um, the application would know who my friends are and reach out to my friend's storage looking for updates or photos or who knows what that my friends have stored in their own storage. Um, so that means I, instead of contacting with Facebook's website, instead in this new model, I would download an app from Facebook and run it, and that app would sort of know how to um, find my friends and look at the data that they're storing. Um, and you know, if my friend uploads a photo to their storage, it's, it's really still, it's their storage, they're paying for it, it's their photo. Um, they can use it with Facebook, or they could use it with other applications too because um, the applications are really quite separate now from the, uh, from the data, instead of being combined um, in the existing architecture. All right, um, so now, um, uh, sort of at the technical level, the, um, 
this is now, the storage interface is now the main interface. So now we have some sort of put, get, or read, write, or who knows what interface as the main interface. It's no longer HTML. It's really a, um, the primary interface we're worried about is the storage style interface, which is a much nicer interface to write applications to than um, HTML is. Um, Furthermore, as I mentioned, there's a much in this architecture where users really own and pay for and organize their own storage, there's a much clearer notion of data being actually owned by the user and controlled by the user, much like you own the data on your laptop or in your Athena account. You know, this is U1's account here in the storage service. Um, of course, there's a number of, but you know, now we're very interested in the design of the storage system because now this is, instead of being sort of hidden away inside websites, this is now the primary interface in the system. So we care a lot about how it's designed. Um, so first of all, it's quite critical that it be an internet service out in the cloud so we can get at it, get at our data from, from any of our devices. Um, it really needs to be general purpose that all the application codes here. So um, we don't now in this architecture really get to have application specific code at all um, on the server side um, because the, Sort of servers aren't, don't really have anything directly to do with applications. So we need a general purpose interface that's powerful enough for, to let us do whatever we need, um, which is a you know, uh, little bit difficult to design. Um, we uh, now, the storage has to be paid for. And now really the most obvious person to pay for it is the user themselves. You know, maybe they're willing to do that, maybe they're not. Um, we'd really like to have this sharing, but we also want to have private data, and maybe we only want to share our data with certain other people. So um, we need some reason. So the storage interface and the storage system, one way or another, needs reasonably powerful sharing and permission um, access control systems. Um, a more subtle issue is that I may run multiple apps. Um, some of which I don't trust, right? If I just download some multi-user game from the internet, you know, maybe I don't want it to be able to look at my email while I'm playing that game. So that means that as well as having a notion of um, sort of this user with this user's permission, we may want to have kind of subsidiary permissions uh, where we can talk about not just this user as a whole, but this user when running application two has certain permissions, um, maybe just game files. This user, when running application one, uh, is allowed to get at the user's email as well. Um, all right, and uh, interestingly to notice is that this storage interface is a, not as much of a stretch as it uh, might have seemed, say, 10 or 20 years ago, because there's a number of, of storage services out there that are not unlike this, like Amazon S3 is very widely used. And while it's missing some of the things we would need here, it's definitely a public storage system. You can buy storage, you can let other people use your storage. You know, it doesn't have all the access control we'd like, but um, it's not too far from what's needed here. And indeed today's papers observes that they can layer their storage system on top of um, one of a number of different existing storage systems. Dropbox is also it's another kind of candidate for something that's like this. Um, and therefore this is not as sort of pie in the sky as it might seem. Okay, so what would the point of this kind of architecture be? Why would anybody care? Um, uh, the people who might care are the users. This, this might give users more uh, more control over their data. It may make it easier for users to switch applications. Like if I've uploaded a bunch of photos and I'm using one photo organization app or photo editing app, um, since my photos are totally separate from the, from the app, I could switch photo apps and maybe still use all my same old set of photos that I already have stored. Um, it may be easier in this architecture to have applications that look at multiple kinds of data. You know, maybe it'd be nice to have my email system be able to look at my calendar and the other way around. Maybe it'd be nice to be able to write backup software that could back up all of my data no matter what it was uh, periodically. Maybe I'd like to have a sort of general purpose file browser which would allow me to look at all of my data. And none of this is possible or convenient in the current architecture, but it's all seems like within reach um, now that we've kind of con concentrated all the user's data into storage that, um, that they own. Um, and finally, there may well be advantages in, in terms of privacy and snooping. Instead of entrusting my data to a web service that who knows what it's doing with it, um, if we play our cards right, we can use encryption. Uh, these applications can encrypt the data before it leaves my client machine so that the only thing that's ever stored here is encrypted data. And 
um, you know, when I read it back, I read back encrypted data and then decrypt it locally on my own machine. So again, storage service never sees uh, private data in the clear. Um, anyway, so that, those are all the sort of, you know, tantalizing possibilities uh, why you might like, why users might like this architecture. Um, all right, so, um, uh, you, you know, the, if you dig down to the nitty gritty of what these applications actually have to do, um, um, they, you, you know, you would need to work out a whole lot of details. Like there needs to be, you know, if, if my application is gonna be looking at your data, there need to be sort of conventions for how data store here. Um, for example, you know, if I'm gonna look at your um, recent posts you made for our social networking application, you have to have stored them in your storage under a key or a name that my application knows to, to try to look, look for. And you have to use a format that we all understand. So, you know, there's some, um, if we want to do sharing, there's some kind of standardization obstacles that have to be overcome that don't really exist for big websites because they can just store their data however they like. Um, Okay, so there's a question, does this adversely affect application performance? Absolutely. Um, this is likely to be um, pretty bad for performance because in the old scheme, the old scheme can be, um, the existing scheme can be implemented with very high performance. You know, these, most of the, the web server may be making hundreds of requests to the database. Like when you look at an Amazon web page, for example, boy, are there hundreds or thousands of pieces of information that had to be pulled out of Amazon's databases. You know, when they're all in the same machine room and the, um, those fetches in the database take dozens of microseconds. Um, but if um, one of these applications needs to reach across the internet, um, you know, to maybe hundreds of miles away to some storage service, uh, you know, it's now everything's gonna take 10 or 100 times as long to fetch individual pieces of data. So yeah, that's certainly an issue and um, you know, it's the kind of, that kind of issue is the kind of thing that clever designers can find ways to deal with. Um, so it would certainly be a problem. Um, but my guess is on the sort of total list of reasons why this architecture is not gonna work. Um, there's a number of other uh, sort of equally unhappy puzzles. And although it would absolutely change how people write applications because instead of writing applications that assemble lots of they use lots and lots of pieces of data. You would have to be much more parsimonious. Um, but I think people could work around it. All right. Um, okay, so any, any questions about this, um, this overall arrangement, which is the sort of arrangement that Blockstack is shooting for? Um, so we should uh, just sort of try to guess, even at this level, what kind of things might go wrong. Um, um, one reason is that this interface is likely to be less flexible than database interfaces. Um, and this actually goes back to the performance a little bit. You know, we're probably not gonna be, well, I mean, this is sort of subject to design, but we're unlikely to be able to, uh, to be supporting super flexible, like, um, SQL queries, and certainly it's unlikely that we're gonna be doing uh, SQL queries across other people's data as well as ours for uh, shared data. Um, so that's certainly one potential problem is that this interface may not be very expressive and that's gonna be painful for programmers. Um, another question is, could this give users an amount of traffic they might not handle? Yeah, so that's also a, um, a potential problem is that the, you know, if you don't, have very powerful queries. M much of what SQL is doing when you talk to a real SQL database is that um, it may be looking through, calls the database server to look through a lot of data, um, but it just finds the one answer you're looking for, maybe the sum of all votes or something. It just sends that one little piece of final data back. Whereas if you don't have a powerful query language, you may end up having to fetch a lot of stuff and um, sort of do the filtering or aggregating yourself. And that just might be a lot of data to be sending across people's links. Um, um, yeah, so things might be slower. Things would be slower, and if it's a question whether they'd be too slow. Maybe in the future in which, you know, everybody has broadband internet and we have 5G cell phones, none of this, will, none of this performance stuff will matter, or maybe it'll be important. I don't know. 
Um, another problem with this setup is that there are some um, websites like eBay where it's really not the case that all the data is sort of definitely owned by one user. So um, for eBay, for example, well, um, actually I have, I have two points here. One is some data is not owned by all users. Think about the front page of Reddit, right? There's, you know, there's some clever algorithms that Reddit is running to pick the order of items in the front page having to do with votes and, you know, who knows what. Like, where do those algorithms run and where do they get the data and maybe where do they store their conclusions about the front page? Um, so that's something that doesn't really fit in. Maybe, you know, maybe it could be fit in here, but uh, that'd be a little bit hard. Um, another kind of website that seems like it would be hard here is, is uh, eBay, where um, you want to bid against other people. You know, eBay tells you whether you have the current highest bid, which requires eBay to look at other people's bids. And then when you finally win, you, you know, the amount you pay has to do with the second highest bid. Um, but those bids are private, right? You don't want um, other people to see your bids because then they can just bid one cent higher than you and win at a low cost. So, you know, maybe you too, user two has stored a bid here. Um, but if my, if I'm bidding against user two and we need this application to tell me if I'm the winning bidder, that means this application needs, in order to answer that question, may need, probably need to know user two bid, user two's bid, um, which means that user two bid has to be accessible to me. But if my application code knows it, well, it's running on my computer and I can change it, right? Those are the usual rules for code you run in your own computer. And if I change my application code to actually reveal your bid, then that's totally cheating from the point of view of what eBay is trying to do. And so nobody would trust the auction system um, that allowed that. So it's really unclear. You know, there's probably tricks that could be used, but um, you know, if we just use this architecture in a straightforward way, uh, websites like eBay that um, need to look at other people's secret data but not reveal the data um, are quite a puzzle as just a, and I already mentioned that websites that have to keep their own data like indexes or vote counts or something um, that's often a puzzle also a puzzle because there's no notion here of you know the website itself there's just application code and generic user owned storage um, because usually, this, I mean, so, so you would probably have to augment this with some trusted servers to run the privacy critical part of eBay or whatever, um, but it doesn't really fit into the model that well. Another thing that's um, gonna turn out to be bad news here is that um, if, I, if I have data that I wanna share with some people and not others, like I wanna share data with just 6824 students, but not outsiders, um, you know, how is that actually enforced? Um, you know, we'd really like to use end-to-end -end encryption so we don't have to trust the storage server because after all, that was a big motivation for moving away from the current website architectures. We don't want to have to trust uh, these, these clouds uh, services. So I could encrypt the data um, so that 6824 students could read it, but it's actually quite difficult to do that um, in any kind of straightforward way. You know, I could encrypt the data a hundred times you know, with once with each of the 6824 students' keys, or maybe I can encrypt the data once with a, some sort of um, unique key and then encrypt that key with 824 students' keys or something. Um, yeah, but then you run into questions, oh, if somebody drops the course and you don't want them to be able to see the data, you know, how do you make sure that now they can't see the data? So you can use encryption for privacy, but um, once you get into sort of complex multi-user applications with, um, groups of users, for example, um, cryptography becomes, can be quite difficult to use to solve your uh, privacy problems. Um, okay, so these are ways in which the um, system may be awkward to, awkward to program. Um, and because it may be awkward to program and awkward to program up features that may leak through into the set of application features you can have being limited also, which um, is not gonna make users very happy either. All right, um, so that's a sort of the high level view of, of what Blockstack is kind of working towards. Um, so now let's, uh, let's maybe focus a little more on, on Blockstack specifically. Um, block, where Blockstack actually originated as a project was as a um, secure naming scheme. Um, and you can still see the, you know, the 
paper we read today has a lot of um, preoccupation with naming. Um, although if you look at their current website and the current stuff they write, it's much more about this decentralized architecture and applications and much less about naming. Um, but naming is still very important for them. So uh, um, the question is, what are they, you know, why are they interested in names and uh, what do they need from a naming system? So the kind of names they're talking about um, in the paper and in Blockstack in general are um, user names. These are really uh, human users. So um, we're talking about uh, names like, you know, maybe um, Robert Morris, right? That's the kind of name they're talking about. Um, because, you know, in their, in their arc, decentralized architecture, they don't, you know, the kind of players in the game are the users. The users own the data, the users need to control who can see their data, um, so they need to be able to name other users. Um, the specific uh, things they need to solve with naming, um, they need to, uh, if, I, if I want to look at your data, um, Blockstack needs to find where your data is. You know, you're storing your data on some storage server somewhere. I need to know what, you know, are you using Amazon AWS and, or maybe Microsoft Azure, you know, and if so, which server at, at Microsoft are, um, is storing your data? So um, Blockstack needs um, a way to map names to um, uh, the location where you store your data. So that's one big thing that they're doing with names. Um, but they also need to find out, um, if I'm going to read your data, I need to be able to do things like check that it's really your data. Um, you know, I can't, we're not, the whole point of this is to not have to trust the storage services. Um, so in order for me to be able to check it's, that it's your data, uh, we need a way to map the name um, to the public key. And we're going to assume that um, when you store data, you sign it with your public key first. So we need both the map names to where to find the person's data and map names to the public key that we can use to check that when we retrieve data, it's really data that you wrote and not some kind of misleading thing cooked up by the storage service or someone else. Um, now, this name to public key thing actually is used in other ways too. If I want to encrypt data so that only you can read it, um, probably the way I'm going to do that is to encrypt the data or some other key um, using your public key so that only your private key can read it. So if I want to implement cryptographic ACLs or really almost any permission scheme, access control scheme, I need to, you have, I need to be able to name the people who can use the data. Um, and so if I'm going to make access control lists, um, these are usually one way or another uh, driven by names. I need to be able to name the people who can read my data. Um, so this, um, in particular, this part that maps names of people to public keys, uh, this is usually often called a public key infrastructure, or PKI. Um, and so what Blockstack is proposing, among other things, is a general purpose sort of public global um, PKI, uh, public key infrastructure to map usernames to users' public keys. And this is actually quite important um, because um, people have known for a long time, decades, decades, that uh, in order to sort of make big advances in internet security, um, almost certainly the only way to do that is um, to have some sort of public key scheme so that people can sign, you know, data that they produce, or email, and um, check signatures on email or data that they receive for other people, and um, also encrypt uh, so that to ensure privacy, so that only the intended reader um, can read the data. So almost any internet-wide scheme or large scheme um, intended to get cryptographic privacy or cryptographic authentication ends up having to involve uh, some sort of public key system, public key infrastructure, so that I can find out, you know, given the identity of the person I want to talk to, how do I find their public key? Um, and yet, um, there kind of isn't um, a successful public key infrastructure system out there. Nobody's really figured out how to build one of these um, that's actually useful. Um, and as a result, people have tended not to build uh, or deploy, people tended not to deploy um, uh, systems with cryptographic uh, privacy and authenticity because there's no PKI. Um, and 
maybe because of that, people haven't worked on PKIs because it's not clear who would use them. But at any rate, um, one of the reasons why Blockstack is interesting is because they're uh, trying hard to build a, a global scale public key infrastructure. Um, now the kind of names, if you remember the paper talks about the Zuko's triangle thing, the kinds of names, the style of names that the um, paper's talking about is they have three, these three interesting properties. One is they're unique. Um, and what that really means actually is that the names have global meaning, that um, the name Robert, for example, has the same meaning to everyone in the world, you know, maps to this in the same way to the same data location, the same public key. Um, to everyone in the world. Of course, that's a little ridiculous for Robert. You know, we, presumably my ID under Blockstack would be much longer than that. You know, maybe Robert Morris. Well, there's a lot of Robert Morrises. So maybe I'm Robert Morris number 67th Robert Morris to register with Blockstack. That would probably be closer to what my name would be under Blockstack. Anyway, that everybody in the world, when they see this name, they run it through the PKI, gets the same information about it. So this really means global. It might be a better. Uh, word for this. The second property the paper talks about uh, for names are they're human readable, um, just like Robert Morris. So somebody can look at it and you know make a guess at what a name means, and some people may be able to remember the names because they sort of have human um, meaningfulness. And the final thing they're interested in is that the naming system and the allocation of names uh, be decentralized. Um, and uh, you know the paper claims, and this is the old claim that it's difficult to get all three. Um, uh, you know, apparently not impossible since the paper does it. Um, the, the sort of intuitive reason why um, it's hard to get all three is that if you have a, um, supposing you have a system that's decentralized, so there's no one entity, you know, in charge of allocating names. Well. If you do that, then it's very hard to ensure uniqueness. That is, if you don't have some single entity handing out the names, how do you know you don't end up handing out the name, same name to multiple people um, if there's not some central trusted entity? Um, and you can actually um, have decentralized and unique names, but um, the most obvious ways to do that sacrifice the human readable part. So if what you decide your names are are gonna be uh, you know, public keys, you know, thousand bit public keys in a public private, cryptography system. Um, anybody can make up a new public-private key pair. Um, they're typically made used random, num random number generators. So since anyone can make one up um, and they're generated randomly, they're going to be unique, um, but they're not human readable. So, you know, many of the obvious uh, ways of trying to get all three of these at the same time um, don't work so well. Uh, the way Blockstack solves these um, this at a very high level. I mean, you know, they're going to produce their, their decentralized system with no central person handing out names. The names are human readable, um, and everyone sees the same set of mappings. The way they do this at a high level is that they rely on Bitcoin's ability to um, produce a single ordered log of transactions. That's one way of viewing Bitcoin is that um, everybody agrees on what the sequence of Bitcoin blocks is. And you know, maybe you get temporary forks, but Bitcoin rapidly resolves any forks and causes everyone to agree on um, what the sequence of blocks is in Bitcoin. Okay, so once we have Bitcoin that's causing agreement on a sequence of transactions, um, we can stick um, anyone, um, can stick transactions into the Bitcoin log that, you know, as well as maybe being valid Bitcoin transactions, also have hidden away in them name reservation records. So now this is, um, it's a sort of uh, naming on Bitcoin, on the Bitcoin blockchain. So, you know, Bitcoin was already uh, getting us uh, sort of unique and globally agreed sequence of these uh, transaction blocks. And now, and anybody can submit a transaction. So in that sense, it's totally decentralized, right? So uh, what, what the way Blockstack uses this for naming is that if I want to register a name, I can pick any name I like, say Robert Morris, um, as long as it's not already in use. 
and I stick in, I submit to Bitcoin um, uh, a transaction, you know, that happens to be a valid Bitcoin transaction, um, but it's also uh, going to be meaningful to Blockstack. And it's going to say, um, you know, please reserve, please allocate the name RTM and map it to whatever my public key and my information about where to have data. Um, and anyone can submit these. And the Blockstack servers, all the Blockstack servers watch the Bitcoin blockchain as it evolves. And um, every time they see one of these uh, records that's a Blockstack transaction as well as a Bitcoin transaction, um, the Blockstack servers think about adding this mapping to their name database. Um, but they have a set of rules uh, for rejecting bad um, block stack transactions in the Bitcoin blockchain. So for example, if some bad person, um, after I've allocated RTM, themselves try to allocate RTM, well, they can submit any transaction they like. So they can perfectly well also um, submit a transaction trying to steal the name RTM from me and mapping it to some other public key that they know the private key for. Well, um, all the block stack servers are watching the Bitcoin chain. There's only one Bitcoin chain and only has a one set of contents. And so the block stack servers, as they you know, sort of look at successive transactions in the Bitcoin chain are gonna see my allocation first. Um, and then they're gonna see this other person's allocation for the same name. And the rule is gonna be, well, if a name's already allocated, it can't be allocated a second time. And the block stack servers will ignore um, this attempted registration of a name. Um, so um, what's being implemented here is a kind of first come first serve um, scheme for allocating names. The first person to get a allocation record into the blockchain uh, wins that name. Um, okay, so as far as those three properties, the Zuko triangle properties, um, it's decentralized because you know, we're gonna, we believe Bitcoin is be decentralized and there's no sort of other entity deciding who gets what's name. It's really just uh, this first come first served scheme. Uh, so it's decentralized. The names can be anything. There's no, these strings, whatever. So they're perfectly reasonable to put human readable names in here. Um, and everybody's looking at the same blockchain for any name they all see, they all agree on what the first registration of that name is. So. Um, it's unique or globally meaningful um, as well. So Blockstack has managed to uh, actually get all three of these Zuko properties in their naming system. There's a question. Does this mean that the Blockstack servers have to scan the entire chain from back to front for adding new names? Yeah, so in principle, sure. The uh, state of the name database is um, uh, really the result of interpreting the whole blockchain. But of course, you know, the block stack servers will um, will cache, you know, cache the latest state they've seen. And as they, in a database, so each block stack server, you know, maybe has read this far in the Bitcoin blockchain and has a database that has the current mapping for every name um, seen in all the blocks before this. And when they see a new block from uh, Bitcoin, they'll just look at the transactions and update their database incrementally to reflect these transactions. So getting a new block stack server up to speed actually does take quite a long time. Um, I think one some paper I read said it might uh, take up to a couple of days. Um, but once your block stack server is up to speed, then it's all sort of incremental additions after that. Um, but you know, there's I mean, the larger point is that it is indeed the case that block stack is kind of piggybacking on uh, Bitcoin and you know, you could easily argue that Bitcoin is not very scalable ultimately or uh, uses up too much electric power, who knows what, um, too slow, takes a long time to reflect new transactions. And so these are all sort of somewhat undesirable properties that uh, Blockstack is inheriting from Bitcoin. But nevertheless, um, you know, it's not, there's, I don't, not aware of uh, another um, way of getting all three of those Zuko's properties um, in a naming system. So if you value them, um, your options are not, uh, you don't have a lot of options other than this approach. Okay, so um, we may ask ourselves um, whether this naming scheme, um, this way of mapping names to public keys and 
places to find the data, whether it's um, whether it really has properties we actually like. So let's go back over those three properties. Um, so one, the um, the uh, the names are unique. Everybody in this system agrees on what RTM means. Um, it's really that the names have global meaning. So the question is whether um, whether we care about this, whether this is a good property. Um, so uh, one, you know, one thing on the plus side for this is that uh, it makes that having these names like this, a human, um, uh, it, you know, if, if that having globally relevant names means that we can talk about names with each other. I can email you a name and that name will have the same meaning for you as it does for me because we're both going to look it up in the blockchain and get the same result. And so that's nice. Um, it also means that I can look at names um, that are recorded somewhere like in an access control list and kind of understand, um, know what they're going to mean. Um, um, but some things that are maybe um, not so great about this is that uh, if you have to choose your names from a single global pool, because that's what we're doing here, right? The, since um, there's just one naming system, there's just one set of names, um, it's going to mean that um, it'll be actually hard to look at a name and decide if it's the name you want. Like my name would actually probably be, as I mentioned before, you know, maybe, you know, RTM95587, depending on how many RTMs are up. So this may be my name. It's actually going to be very hard to look at that and decide, is that the RTM that you really meant? And so that really undermines the um, human readable uh, property that they have here. Uh, the bigger the system is, the kind of less valuable having human readable names is. If it's just people at MIT, you know, maybe, we, maybe there's only one Robert Morris at MIT, although actually there's more than one. Um, but you know, across the world, um, the kind of justification for caring about whether names are human readable is uh, uh, gets is very slim. Um, it's also a human readable can be deceptive depending on what's going on. So um, if you see a name that looks like you know RTM at MIT.edu, you know if you see that name in, in Blockstack or something, it's tempting to imagine that it might be connected to that email address, right? Because it looks, it's human readable. It like looks like it has meaning. And that's the whole point of having human readable names is that they kind of suggest meaning to people. Um, but at least for Blockstack, that's deeply misleading. In a Blockstack, the names really don't mean anything. It's simply first come, first serve. So all we know, all we can tell by seeing this name, rtm at mit.edu from Blockstack, is that this is this name means the first person this name refers to the first person who registered this name. That's all we know initially. It might be me, it might be somebody else. There's no reason to believe it's me or that it's associated with MIT or anything else. All we know is that this name is owned by whoever registered it first. Now, if I um, establish, say, a secure email conversation with, with whoever owns this name, you know, using the key that Blopsk staff maps this to, and I spend some time talking to them, you know, maybe I can eventually convince myself that um, they're the person who I think they are. Uh, but the name alone is, looks like it's meaningful, but probably is not, in fact, very meaningful. Um, so that's a real defect in human readable names that, that could be defective. Um, and, you know, related to that, uh, the block stack naming scheme um, doesn't help me find if, if I sort of know who I want to talk to, Blockstack's not really helping me find the name of the person I want to talk to. You know, maybe, maybe you know you want to send email to Robert Morris. You know, gosh, this is deeply unhelpful. And it's the only thing in the Blockstack naming system is names that are like this. Um, so it's really not necessarily solving the problem that people have, which is, I, I, know, I sort of know in my head who I want to talk to, but I don't know their public key and I don't know their block stack name either. How do I find their block stack name? Um, so that's a sort of a defect in this system. You have to, you really have to already know the name if you want to use uh, block stacks naming scheme, but how do you find those names? 
Um, some other options that you could consider for naming um, in a system, the sort of larger decentralized system. Um, one is that we could just abandon names, human readable names, you know, not try to get all three of those Zuko properties and just use public keys directly. Um, so that would mean if I want to interact with you, I need to find your public key somehow. Maybe you just send it to me. You know, maybe you tell me something over the phone I can use to get your public key. Maybe you uh, send me a secure message or write it on a slip of paper or something. So we could just use directly use public keys. And then we wouldn't have to solve all these problems, although of course they're awkward. Um, although maybe I can store the public keys I know about in my personal contact list um, and that'd be helpful. It'd be like telephone numbers. The telephone numbers don't mean anything. Um, but once I know your phone number, um, I can stick it in my contact list. Another possible approach would be to abandon the decentralized part and just try to cook up some central entity that would actually reliably verify identity, that some centralized entity, you know, maybe the social security system that hands out social security numbers or, uh, you know, whoever it is that hands out driver's license or something and kind of piggyback on their work to um, establish a, a centralized notion of um, unique kind of verified names. <laughs> um, that's actually remarkably difficult also. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's another avenue to think about. Um, anyway, so Blockstack took this particular approach to uh, trying to get names. All right. Um, uh, the, um, let me just um, kind of outline the big picture of the pieces in block stack, um, which is sort of a refinement of the decentralized application uh, diagram that I showed before. Um, sort of at the bottom, they have this Bitcoin system that's um, chugging along uh, with Bitcoin uh, blocks and that carry along kind of unknown to Bitcoin, these block stack transactions. Um, there's a bunch of block stack naming system um, servers, and it's not really clear whether they intend ordinary people to run them or that they would be a service. In a way, it makes most sense for ordinary people to run them be on their own laptops because you have to trust them, but um, that may not be so great. Anyway, these block stack naming service servers uh, read the blockchain and kind of accumulate a database. Um, th these, at least in the first instance, what's in block what's in the Bitcoin blockchain is um, public keys and the hash, the cryptographic hash of um, information describing where each user stores their data. Um, because you could store that information. This is just, you know, RTM stores his data in Amazon AWS or something. Um, but that's too big to sort of conveniently store in Bitcoin. And so there's this kind of, intermediate layer called Atlas, um, whose really its only job is to map um, hashes of information that are stashed in Bitcoin into the zone information, um, one zone record per user. And so that means that my, you know, if I have an RTM you know, registration and block stack that holds the hash of my zone record, this just has the name or the you know, internet address or something of where I store my data. So it might be, you know, AWS slash, you know, whatever identifier I use to uniquely identify the stuff that I store in AWS. Um, and this is really a reference to um, my where my storage sits, where all my key value pairs um, are stored. Um, now, uh, the... Um, the paper, I think the paper's uh, vision is that you'd be able to um, have your zone record point to any cloud storage out there. In fact, the cloud storage system has to, you know, obey the block stack interface. And so you can't just use any existing cloud storage system. So in practice, these all point to block, at the moment at least, block stack's own Gaia servers. They run this, uh, and these are just storage servers that know about different block stack users. Um, and store their key value pairs for them. And that means if I want to read your data out of, if I'm running a, a block stack application that wants to read your data, I need to supply your name somehow. I gotta find your name, maybe you uh, tell me your name over the phone. I type your name into the application I'm using, 
Uh, maybe it's a to-do list manager and it needs to go out and find your to-do list items to show me. Um, my app is gonna contact a Blockstack naming system server and ask it to translate your name. It's, it's been watching the blockchain. It keeps a mapping. Um, it knows how to use the hash to find your zone record. Your zone record points to some data owned by you in Gaia. Um, and then my app fetches this data. Um, it needs to verify the data. Um, so it's, uh, all Blockstack apps expect data to be signed by the owner in Gaia. And the public key to check your signature on the data, you know, I can use your public key, your public key is embedded in the, uh, your record and Bitcoin, and so I can use it to, my app really can use it to check the signature here, make sure that this is data that you actually produced and not something that an untrustworthy Gaia server uh, cooked up. Um, okay, so that's sort of a basic outline of um, how this works. It, it turns out that sort of embedding their information in the Bitcoin blockchain is not as straightforward um, as I described. Uh, they, they have, um, they need to take special efforts to detect forks, for example, because they don't get to, the Blockstack name servers don't sort of get to realize directly that there's been a fork, they have to detect it. I mean, they need to detect it because the fork might be part of an attack. Um, and, um, you know, the Bitcoin isn't, uh, filtering out bad records for them. And so they have to do their own, enforce their own rules on the records they get out, like ignoring duplicate registrations. There's, um, they also, turns out, need to charge, they charge fees for registering a name. And that means that the Bitcoin transaction that uh, is the registration of a name has to pay some money to what's called a burn address, pay some Bitcoin current bitcoins to a burn address in order to have the right to register that name and the, the block stack name service actually checked that each name registration transaction did pay enough bitcoin to um, this burn address for which there's no private key so the money simply disappears um, and the reason they do this the reason why they uh, require every name registration to waste some money um, is that otherwise it's too easy for bad people to just register lots and lots of names. Um, like certainly the experience with the domain name system where for a while name registration was free was that people would just register, you know, every single, um, you know, one, two, and three letter combination that's possible. And they wouldn't own all these names for free. Or somebody knowing that I would really like to own the name RTM might register it before me. Um, and then if I wanted to use it, I have to pay them. So in order to try to deter that, they have uh, they require fees. Um, and that's actually almost probably an important part of, of the design, since free stuff on the internet tends to be, uh, tends to be abused or um, sort of drowned out in intentional spam. All right. Um, one detail in this picture, so I left out the, the, in this picture, we have the client machine that's running some app. Um, this is the client device. Um, now, when the app needs to get out my data, get out my data, um, it needs to um, be able to decrypt it. Um, whenever it writes data into my Gaia storage, my app needs to be able to encrypt it, ultimately using my uh, private key. And when it fetches data back, it needs to be able to decrypt it also, ultimately, um, one way or another, using my private key. So these applications need to get at private keys. Um, but private keys are super duper sensitive. Um, and uh, whereas these apps are just whatever junk I downloaded from the Blockstack app store and possibly totally untrustworthy. Um, so we never want to give them a private key. Um, so what actually happens is that there's a separate um, program that I'm always running called the Blockstack browser. Um, and it's this program that knows my private key. Um, and so if the app wants to do stuff as me, it's really got to first um, do it through the Blockstack browser. Um, and in fact, the way this plays out sort of complicated and detailed the block stack browser essentially makes up a kind of per app private key and this app uses just the per app private key and not my real sort of master private key. So this app, again, doesn't get to know my real private key. Um, 
but this issue of not revealing sensitive key material to the uh, these apps, which may be indeed quite untrustworthy, um, uh, is an important detail. And Blockstack keeps my master private key secret. Now, on the topic of private keys, um, a weakness in essentially every system, uh, you know, like Bitcoin itself and well, Blockstack, and also is that um, users. Um, tend not to be as careful as they ought to be about private keys. So my, you know, if I'm going to use Blockstack from my phone, you know, that means my phone has to know my private key. If I leave my phone um, in the cafeteria, then whoever finds it now has a device that has my private key in it and can do anything as me, because as far as Blockstack is concerned, they are me if they know my private key. Um, users also tend to lose private keys. Um, you know, I don't use a service for a little while. You know, I forget whatever passphrase it was, for example, that was protecting the private key, or I put my private key on a USB somewhere key for somewhere for safekeeping and then lose the USB key. So that's a completely uh, routine problem that users have. Um, and Blockstack actually does not really have an answer to these questions. And they pretty much assume that users will be careful of their private keys. And if you lose your private key, um, Blockstack can't get it back for you. It's like it's in order to be super secure, in order for you not to have to trust Blockstack, only your client knows your private key. If you lose your client, we you forget your uh, whatever the passphrase is, um, you're just completely out of luck and Blockstack can't help you. Um, and so this is just a difficulty in real life. People don't want to use systems that are that brittle. Um, and in real life, what ends up happening is that even systems that have you know, serious cryptography usually have some sort of key retrieval scheme whereby I can, there's something I can tell Blockstack, maybe my mother's maiden name, or you know, they send me an SMS thing to my telephone or whatever, some scheme I can use to recover my private key. Um, and those, if you wanna attack a system, it's often uh, the password recovery or the key recovery aspect of the system that's the easiest to attack. I just call a block stack. I said, I said, tell them, you know, I'm really, I'm Robert Morris. You got to believe me, please, you know, reset Robert Morris's key for me or password um, and tell me the new password. And if I'm convincing enough, you know, and the system allows uh, key resets, um, they're going to let me have it. And thereby also presumably if it's an attacker really who is calling and pretending to be me, they'll let the attacker uh, reset the password or the key or whatever. Blockstack happens not to allow that because it's so obviously insecure. Um, but real world systems, um, uh, if they don't want their users to abandon them, uh, need to have a better plan. And it's not clear how to make that better plan. All right. Um, all right. Uh, there's. Um, uh, a couple of sort of, uh, uh, sort of issues I want to talk about that come up in the system. Um, for me, the block stack is really a kind of source of questions to think about, um, or even kind of things that are not really what well, you know uh, suggestions for new for more things to work on. You know, block stack. I think block stack situation now is that you probably wouldn't actually want to use it. Um, to build a real system for real users. Um, but it, it's kind of trying to point the way to a system that might someday be, if enough cleverness was put into it and enough development was done on it, might actually be a system that was both convenient uh, for programmers and actually provided some real value for users. But it's probably not there yet, but it's interesting to think about you know, how it could be designed differently or better um, in order to kind of get it closer to something that would really be useful. Um, so one question you might have, especially in the context of 824, is whether Blockstack really needs to use Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin's really not, you know, not that great. Um, the, the fees that you have to pay, you know, to register a name, you know, vary in value on Bitcoin by factors of, you know, 100 almost every night, overnight um, at times. In addition, people really don't the way, like the way Bitcoin um, uses proof of work to uh, burn up CPU in order to be secure. So, you know, Bitcoin's not not perfect, although it's uh, kind of an important part of the system. Otherwise, they 
couldn't, you know, they, it's not clear how they would do names without this whole Bitcoin tie-in. Um, so one question you might have, uh, 824, is whether um, certificate transparency, which is a, you know, we looked at it last week, certificate transparency does not have mining, does not have proof of work, and yet, you know, it's powerful enough to be helpful in a naming system. Um, and so the question is whether, instead of Bitcoin, whether um, Blockstack could use something like certificate transparency um, in order to uh, um, enforce adequate rules about names. And I actually don't know the answer to that. My guess um, is the answer is no. Uh, my, my, my feeling is that while certificate transparency can reveal uh, conflicts, where a conflict really is a uh, two people registering the same name, like if you required everybody to s submit their name registrations to a certificate transparency log, yes, indeed, you would be able to see that two people had registered the same name. But certificate transparency doesn't resolve ownership conflicts. So if I register RT, you know, supposing last year I registered RTM and I've been using it happily for the next year and then somebody else registers RTM today, yeah, you know, they'll submit their registration to a certificate transparency log um, and so now maybe that will make my name unusable or something. Um, but it's not clear really who should own the name because certificate transparency doesn't have very powerful mechanisms for um, resolving these conflicts. You might think that um, order would be enough, but um, the same records in different certificate transparency logs can have different order because there's nothing forcing the different transparency logs to, uh, to have exactly the same order. Um, and um, if you want, you know, how come Bitcoin can enforce every replica of the blockchain to have the same order? I believe the answer to that really boils down to Bitcoin's mining. I mean, it's, it's Bitcoin's mining that resolves forks, it resolves uh, uh, differing copies of the blockchain um, and forces agreement. And if you don't do mining, at least, you know, or something like mining, it's, it's not that clear uh, how to, how to um, enf enforce agreement on the order of the records. Um, so, um, in addition, uh, uh, the fees the block stack charges are probably critical to avoid various kinds of spam um, in the naming system, uh, various kinds of abuse. And you know, block stack built on Bitcoin can sort of automatically require people to pay to register. Block stack built on certificate transparency, you know, the, there's no no direct mechanism um, to require fees. Um, and in fact. I think the point here is actually quite a bit larger, and that's that um, uh, a lot of you know, people talk about using blockchains for lots of stuff other than cryptocurrency, but um, in fact, it seems difficult to use blockchains, open blockchains with unrestricted access, um, except um, when they're coupled with some kind of cryptocurren cryptocurrency. Um, again, I don't know if that's true, but it's certainly my impression. Um, all right, so uh, a big question with Blockstack is whether it's um, gonna be convenient for programmers. And to me, the, the, uh, this question's absolutely critical because, um, or it's one of two very critical questions. The other one is, the other critical question is whether it makes users' lives better. Um, um, the, uh, my, my perception at the moment is that indeed Blockstack is not particularly convenient for programmers. I think I, I've, I've used Blockstack, I've programmed Blockstack, I've tried to build systems that are like it. Um, and my strong impression is that it's just a lot more difficult to build a web application on one of these decentralized platforms um, than it is on the ordinary platform. And you know that's kind of damaging because uh, if the website developers aren't on board, then uh, nobody's gonna get a lot of traction. And the, if the website developers don't like, you know, or sort of feel that the system is difficult to program, the only way that you're ever gonna get um, any traction is if the attraction to users is so strong that, it, that you know, users demand uh, decentralized applications and that might force programmers to use it. Um, but the programmers just speaking for themselves, um, my guess is that uh, the architecture in which basically all the code is sitting in the client and we don't have special you know, website servers is just pretty painful. Um, 
it's hard to have data that's specific to the application because you know, all data is owned by users. It's hard to have indices or you know counts of likes or vote counts. You know the kind of front page rankings, as I mentioned, for Reddit or Hacker News are difficult. There's just all kinds of stuff that's a pain um, if you don't have a notion, a notion of the website itself with its own data. Um, this uh, the access control is actually equally painful. Um, it's very easy to write the code in a traditional website to decide who gets to see what data. Um, in a decentralized system, it really only can be enforced uh, using cryptographic access control, or at least you know, that's the way it seems from the example of Blockstack. Um, and it just turns out for all, except for very straightforward, like one user using their own private data, using cryptography to enforce access control is just uh, pretty painful. Um, so, uh, programmers might only be excited if users were excited. So, are users going to be excited? You know, one way to look at that, one way to ask that question, um, is whether this kind of decentralized user-owned storage um, is good for user privacy. Because that's one of the big pitches: is that by um, storing data on stored services that users own and pay for, you know, maybe that'll keep the data more private, more secure than. Uh, storing their data on websites. Um, so that really amounts to asking, is it better than trusting Facebook or Google um, to keep my data private, um, both from uh, Facebook employees and from other users of the site and from hackers who might try to break in? Um, and that's just a question, right? You know, it sort of depends on how much you trust Facebook. The fact is that you're still storing your data out there in the cloud on some service, just maybe not Facebook. Um, and you're still running software on your client that uh, is presumably provided to you by Facebook. So you're running Facebook software on your client. You know, it's um, so you're still kind of trusting this 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 code that Facebook gives you or whoever you get your code from. Um, and you know, for the real hackers among us, you can look at the code and convince yourself because you're running it on your own computer and convince yourself that it's okay. But uh, for the general public. You know, the, the difference between talking to Facebook's web software on their web server and running Facebook software on their own client may not uh, seem very great. You know, who knows, maybe the Facebook app you're running is, is sort of sending Facebook uh, information about what you're up to, snooping on you. Um, there's a question about why is cryptographic access control painful for programmers? Um, one way of looking at it is that the access control checks that you have to do in a sort of standard website are very straightforward. You just write a little bit of Python code or whatever it is to uh, decide whether some user should be able to see some data. And you can even compute using data that the user shouldn't see um, as long as you don't reveal it to the user. Whereas in anything but simple situations, um, doing the cryptography to uh, allow some users but not others to get at your data it it's just requires a lot more thought. So, um, you know, suppose the MIT registrar maintains a list of all the people taking 824, and you know, so that's a group. Um, so they maintain that list, and I want to use it in order to govern the protections for some file uh, stored in um, with cryptographic protection and block stack. Because that list, that group list of 824 students may change. Um, the, you know, the what I do for encryption may have to change too. So, um, uh, you know, if I encrypt, I could encrypt the data once with the key of each user in the 824 group list, and that would work because, you know, then, then they, they could just read the copy that was encrypted for them. But then as users are added, as the registrar changes the list, adds or deletes users, I need, my software, I needs to notice that that list has changed. Um, and busily go out and um, change the way stuff is encrypted, re-encrypt for the new users, delete the encrypted copies for the old users. And that's just like a level of damage that, or a level of kind of complexity that doesn't exist in current systems. It, not necessarily that it can't be done, um, but it just does require a lot of machinery that um, is not ordinarily needed. Um, all right. Um, another uh, sort of trust issue um, 
from the point of view of users is that they still have to trust their storage provider to preserve their data. Um, and they still have to trust their storage provider to always serve up the most recent copy, right? We, the cheating storage provider might try to cause trouble by serving up an old version. So we, at least in the block stack design, you know, you're, you're really trusting your storage server, this central service is from your point of view to uh, do the right thing with your data, uh, to preserve it, to back it up, uh, to produce it when asked for, to produce the right version when asked for. Um, and it is a bit of a question uh, for just ordinary people uh, that if you're trusting um, Amazon AWS to store your data correctly and not lose it, um, it's not that much bigger of a step to trust Amazon itself to run the website. Um, and, you know, we can argue about whether that's really exactly true, but I think, you know, from a high level point of view for uh, most people, most ordinary people, it's really a pretty, uh, pretty small distinction. And you would have to overcome that in order to persuade people that, boy, you know, the um, block stack approach of uh, using Amazon as a storage service is better than the standard way of using Amazon as a website. Um, another question from user's point of view, another pitch for why the decentralized architecture might be better for users is that it gives them more control over, over um, you know, not privacy, but just sort of what applications they use with their data. So if you want to switch applications, but still use the same data, like change photo editing apps, like I mentioned, um, in principle, that should be easier uh, with um, this sort of decentralized app, uh, architecture. Um, because the, you know, the, again, the data is not owned by the uh, application website. If you want to use the same data in multiple different applications, like I want to run a calendar app, but use the same data um, from my email app, that also is you know, relatively convenient um, with the decentralized scheme because the data is sort of, again, independent from the applications. Um, you know, maybe users want this, maybe they don't. It's probably not at the top of anybody's list. Um, and there's an additional problem that in order even for that vision to work, uh, there has to be a lot of standardization of formats of files. Um, so, you know, the calendar file that my calendar program has to store its calendar data in a format that the, my email program can understand. Otherwise, uh, that doesn't work. And if I'm going to switch email applications, well, my old email application better have been storing my email in a format that my new email application um, can understand. Otherwise, this vision of uh, decentralized apps being e easy to switch among um, can't be made to come true. Um, and a final issue that um, sort of worries me about this whole thing is that it's not clear that users are going to be willing to pay for their own storage. Um, if people aren't willing to pay for their own storage, then this whole arrangement is uh, pretty unattractive because a lot of the point was to sort of give the users more responsibility over their own, uh, storing their own stuff. Um, users are, I think, are so used to free advertise, advertisement supported services that they just might not be willing to get on board with, uh, with paying for internet stuff. All right, nevertheless, um, I, I feel like this whole area is, is you know, well worth keeping an eye on, maybe even uh, worth sort of working on different pieces of it if you're interested in looking um, for research problems. Um, and while I don't really believe it right now for the reasons that I outlined, um, I think it's absolutely worth uh, pursuing because someday, like it definitely the, the way this, these kinds of decentralized systems work um, has been getting better and may eventually be good enough that, uh, that there's serious competition for um, existing website architectures. And I would just love it if, if such, if serious competition like that were, were to arise. All right, um, that's all I have to say. Um, next Tuesday, the last class meeting, meeting is gonna be project presentation. So we'll get to hear what, um, what everybody who hasn't been doing Lab 4 has been up to. Um, uh, please uh, ask me questions if you have them.